Hi, and welcome to another episode of Tom Ray's Art Podcast. I'm Tom. On today's show, I talk to another comic writer. And oddly enough, I also met him at the Mighty Con, just like the person I spoke with last week. So this person has been writing several comic novels, and he's got another one that's coming out. And on top of that, another one for a different series coming out. And also, he put out a series of uh, essays about writing for comic novels because he was a high school teacher and taught a course on it and turned it into a novel that, so he does a lot of stuff. And we actually talk about the fact that uh, he thinks a lot of his stuff is taking a while or so he says, and it's like, no, he has plans for next year, like two things planned for next year. That's not taking your time, but you know, that's a good thing. So it was great to find out more about how he, manages these several projects and actually finds a way to get them done. Uh, He's also got one of them that's going through a publisher and another one that he's self-publishing. So we talk about the differences between actually finding a publisher and publishing yourself and the benefits and how you promote that, how you get the word out and how he travels with the Comic-Con circuits to help promote his book and how he's met a lot of people through that. So here is my interview with, oh, and his comic is called Rebirth of the Gangster. Uh, I had an issue and I meant to have it right next to me so I could hold it up, but I don't have it right here. But that's the one that I read that I met him that he was promoting. So here is my interview starting right now. I'm CJ Sandal. I'm a writer of Rebirth of the Gangster, Beowulf, and then I've also written a book. Both of those two prior ones are comic series, and then I've also written a book called Outside the Panels, Comics, The Classroom, and the Creative Life. That's a a collection of essays about my former job as a teacher, and then just kind of my process of turning from a comic fan to becoming a comic creator. Um, and then Rebirth of the Gangster is a kind of as the, the title leads to, it's kind of like a neo-noir um, crime drama. And then Beowulf is a modern day mashup of Beowulf and Lovecraftian horror. Yeah. And that one's B-E-A, like like it's initials. And then the last name is Wolf at W-U-L-F, correct? Yep. Yeah. B-A-E uh, initials, W-U-L-F. Um, okay. The initials, well, the Bay is to also kind of reinforce that modern day um, aspect of the of the title. But um, the initials also stand for our Bay, Beowulf for the, the title, um, Brenda Amy Edmonton. So it kind of, I guess, has a couple meanings in that sense. Yeah. And I met you recently because of one of the books that you're doing, which was uh, Rebirth of the Gangster. I met you at the uh, Mighty Con here, which I just got done talking to another person that I met at the Mighty Con, who is also a comic writer. So I, I met you and you were you were promoting that book. So are you working on both those books together, like at the same time? Are they two series you're actively doing or like, how are you doing that? Yep. So I'm working on both of them uh, together. They're both active series. I started Rebirth of the Gangster first about four years ago. um, And I released kind of each issue or chapter individually, um, digitally first. And then I compile each six uh, issue story arc into the trade paperback collection. So I've had Act 1, Act 2, and Act 3 for Rebirth of the Gangster. And then um, we're about halfway through Act 4, which is actually going to be the the end of the series itself. Um, And I guess I would be remiss... Uh, if I didn't mention that I've been working on Rebirth of the Gangster with the great uh, Juan Romero. He's the artist who just does a fantastic job. A lot of the story hinges on just kind of character development and character expressions and really making the characters act very well. So I could write the best thing, but if I if I didn't have an artist who could sell that like Juan does so very well, um, it, I'd be kind of out of luck. So he's been a great collaborator, not just in the work he produces, but also he's just been a great collaborator. Um, and that, like I said, Act 4 will be kind of the last the vault, the last volume in that series. That should be coming out around spring of next year of 2022. Oh, wow. Um, Beowulf started uh, about two years ago. So I'd, I already had a couple of years of experience writing Rebirth of the Gangster. Um, and we've been kind of, that one is released through Marcosia. They're the publisher for that. And we've been kind of doing more just kind of mini series um, and then releasing those um, in trade format. The first mini series was actually more just kind of a prestige format, um, 52 page comic. Um, so we just released that all at once in a print edition. Yeah. Um, whereas our next mini series, which we're about to finish uh, the, the haunting of Chinatown um, that has been released digitally uh 
Uh, and then once the fourth issue, which we're um, about halfway done, once that is complete, then it'll be released as another trade. Um, and then I have another storyline for Beowulf to, to come out after that. Um, and so nice. those have been kind of yeah, ongoing, ongoing um, ventures. I am also writing a superhero comic that is going to be actually an original graphic novel. So it'll be kind of released a little bit differently than, than these other two have been. Um, but that one is um, going to be something that's going to be a little bit more long-term process. Uh, I would actually not expect that to be out for another year or two, um, partly because I'm still writing the script, but also um, it, based off the nature of it, um, there's going to be a lot of different artists that I'm going to have to involve um, because I'm going to actually be doing a lot of like getting artists who can do homages of, uh, some great kind of comic artists, uh, superhero comic artists, rather, um, throughout history, kind of like I'll be doing a, a, somebody who's going to be doing like a, a John Romita Sr. Spider-Man era kind yeah. of style, somebody who's going to be doing a kind of a Sal Buscema, like 80s Avengers style and so on and so forth. So that's kind of my other ongoing, uh, or that's the, my other project, which I'm I'm currently in development. Um, but I like how you, it. I like how you said that it's long term. Like, and and it'll probably be out next year. You're already on the process of re- releasing another one next year, and you're like, but this one's going to be like forever ago in, in next <laughs> yeah. year. It's how are you? Yeah. How are you? What's the process that you do? Where the, I feel like you are overlapping these quite well and adding another one on top of it. So how, what? Like, what's the method that you use to write all this? Sure. So I guess um, first off, part of the reason I do this is just. I have that like writer's itch, uh, writer's itch in me that I need to kind of scratch different genres and different, um, uh, just even like different distribution methods. Like I kind of said, like Rebirth the Gangster was really much more like the typical episodic, right? Um, episodic issues that are then compiled into trades. Beowulf is more mini series, and then the superhero one will be um, more of an original graphic novel. So I've so kind of just talking about those going from crime to like horror, adventure, thriller to a superhero one, uh, and in those different formats. Um, part of the reason I do that is I get to be honest a little bored if I'm just doing kind of the same thing over and over. Yeah. So I kind of um, just I, I want to stretch and do, do new things. Um, that's also why I kind of had that traditional book of essays. And then I haven't even mentioned this, but I'm writing a, like a YA fantasy called Mapping Mythland. A YA? Is, um, oh, a youth, a youth, uh, is young that, adult. Yeah. yeah youth adult. I'm, okay. I'm calling it YA to be honest. I'm writing it for like seven year old me. So like, I think seven year old me. <laughs> There's wrote, nothing wrong with read, that. Like, yeah. Seven year old me still read like Lord of the Rings, Hobbit, like stuff that was kind of outside, I guess my age range. Yeah. Um, but I, I but the way it's probably going to be publicized is YA because that's, one that's selling, of course, but two that is kind of I think the the nice middle ground because I'm really writing it for really a reader of all ages, yeah. um, and more just for myself. And actually, um, my girlfriend, it was actually something that I was writing for her every um, kind of every significant day of like a Christmas anniversary, birthday, stuff like that. And it was a gift for her, um, partly because the characters are slightly based off us, and there are some oh, elements okay. of our relationship that are involved. But so kind of. To back to your original question, sorry, I'm, that's okay. I can go off on t- can go off on tangents. This might be kind of why I like like to keep going and start new projects while I'm still working on old ones. No, but that's um, what I want to know because there are a lot of people that have those ideas. But it's the making the time. It sounds like you actually make the time, and that's definitely what I want to know. It's like how are you putting this together and actually making it something that has an end to it, you know, <laughs> or, sure. or at least has a result to it, not an end, because you're continuously making it. Yeah, that makes uh, yeah makes perfect sense. Um, I think the the first step of any kind of project I have is really just kind of throwing any ideas I can get down there. Um, once just kind of an an idea and like characters and plot or even struck story structure stuff like that kind of starts coming to me, I just start writing down some ideas. And some of those projects will just die at that point because maybe a, a couple of weeks or a month okay. or so will, will pass by and it really just hasn't seized me. Yeah. But if there are some of these projects that they like, it's still kind of in the back of my head. I still keep thinking about, still keep thinking about things to add to kind of that brainstorming document I have. I know that's something that I want to kind of pursue through the end. So kind of the first step is really just kind of this blank page of just brainstorming document. I throw down a bunch of ideas there um, and then kind of keep throwing ideas down there for a few months uh, up to maybe even a year. Okay. Um, and then again, if it's still something that keeps driving me that long, that means it's something I want to continue with and develop at some point. And does this um, flesh out like to the, uh, into a story? Like, I guess 
when so I can understand like making lots of notes, but then it's like going through them and then structuring them into something that becomes something. Like I it, like I'd love to know I'm because I'm great. I I have I I go looking for notes and I'm like, damn, I forgot I wrote this one like a year ago, and that's a great idea. And then I start going down that rabbit hole. Like, <laughs> you know, right? Gonna, yeah, yeah. So um, I, I essentially at some point. Once I feel like I've got enough ideas down and then it really is a spot where it's really something that I can start shaping into a story arc, yeah. into an outline, that's when I actually do start working on that outline. Um, and in the past, I haven't done it so much now that I've had kind of more um, practice actually writing. But in the past, I would read before I before Rebirth of the Gangster, before I really started outlining, I would read um, some, some kind of just uh, books that help with the plotting of comics, plotting of anything, even whether it's comics okay. or different media. I like so that. I've, I've read like Alan Moore's writing for comics. I've read some, some stuff that are comic specific. I've also read stuff that is more geared towards screenplays like um, save the cat by some, at least financially successful screenwriter in Hollywood. Okay. Um, like I think he wrote like Miss Congeniality, which to be honest, isn't really my cup of tea, but I do see but like it's a, it's he, a yeah, he made a movie and you spells, didn't, and you know, movie, yep, exactly. <laughs> um, and so, and a lot of, especially with save the cat, a lot of his, um, his, uh, the focus of that book is really kind of this, this is kind of the typical structure of a story, um, that you have like toward the end, the all is the all is lost or all is almost lost phase, which is, some a lot of this stuff is really pretty standard, but it sometimes helps to get kind of that um, to get some sort of name and kind of get some um, tips or or, or um, some more some tips or some examples of those stages. There's also the stage like at the beginning where something that you have to have the hero do something good or at least show that they're like a good person so that we have something to root for them. And again, some of the, okay. these things are pretty self-explanatory, obvious, but it really is uh, helpful to kind of look at that and just kind of reaffirm review stuff. Um, and then once I've, once I had kind of internalized some of that stuff, then I really started working on the outline for rebirth of the gangster and probably chucked out about like 50, 75% of the notes I'd taken because they didn't necessarily fit inside that kind of, uh, those story beats and that structure, but it really kind of helped me see kind of, this is where I need to start. And this is kind of some stuff I need to do with the main characters to get them likable. And then here's how I can kind of escalate the conflict and so on until it gets towards the, like the all is lost phase. Okay. Um, here's how I'm going to resolve it. So I did. Um, so after I kind of had done some of that review and really started uh, um, thinking about rebirth, the gangster gangster in terms of these, uh, the ideas, I really kind of structured it into an outline at that point. Um, I still did not have any artist. So it was really all just still me. Um, yeah, because on top of that, I, you had to like go find artists and stuff. So here it is, you're writing the story, but not only that, but you're also adding like, oh, you need people to write it. There's public. So yeah, how did you find uh, Juan, who is a great artist, by the way? I agree with what you said about about Juan earlier. But uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, how did you um, find the artist? So I found him on uh, Zwol, Z W O L dot org. It's uh, it's a, like a forum website, but there is a specific forum that's like comic writer seeking artists and vice oh. versa. So it's just comic creators seeking each other. Okay. And so I essentially put some posts and I kind of did a general summary of the story. And then just, I had a bunch of artists contact me. Um, and then kind of you look through their portfolio and try to see what really works both aesthetically, but also to be honest, especially since I was just getting this started on this, what works financially for you. Yeah. Um, this was back. I started this back when I was a teacher. So didn't necessarily have the biggest bank to kind of be, to be paying an artist and um, kind of looking through at all the artists. There were really only two that really stood out Juan. And then to be honest, I don't even remember the other one, um, but Juan really captured the aesthetic the best. And I guess the even better or maybe not the better thing, but a good thing too, is that he was the, he was cheaper um, than mm. the other artists that I was looking at. So it was kind of both aesthetically and financially, he was the best fit. Um, so I found, I, so I, I looked at a lot of his stuff and to be honest, the thing that really sold me on Juan was um, looking at his portfolio. I looked at some of like his past published comic work yeah, and that tended to be more in like color, um, which as you know, Rebirth the Gangster is kind of done in that gritty noir, black and white style. Right. Um, and so I had, I, if I just kind of like really quickly looked at Juan's stuff, I went to found out that he was capable of doing this really good stuff, but eventually um, digging through some of his stuff, he actually had some like personal projects he'd worked on that was, that were done in that black and white okay. style. And so once I saw that, I knew that he was the right fit for the uh, project 
assuming of course that um, once he kind of sent some character sketches and I saw a little bit more of uh, his stuff tailored towards towards my towards Rebirth the Gangster, um, assuming that that was going to go well, I knew that he was going to be the artist for me. Um, How long did you guys go back and forth before you started actually working on the comic? So um, we probably went back and forth for about a month, month and a half. Even and, that was quick um, for you. I like it. You, you yeah. get, you do deadlines, man. I'm, I'm impressed. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's, I think to be honest, that has something to do with, I knew that if, uh, if I just kept, took my time, I'd have somewhat of a perfectionist tendency. And I know that if I like kind of push things down the road, that nothing will ever, ever get done. So yeah. I really kind of made, I made a conscious decision um, after kind of, I actually had like, Oh, uh, spent a year, year and a half kind of, spent putting a bunch of ideas for Rebirth the Gangster down, outlining it. And I knew that that was kind of taking a long time. I even actually, before I contacted Juan, I actually wrote the script for the first issue, um, which nice. are going to be 24 issues total in the series. Um, and so kind of in that stage between the, the, the script for the first issue and writing the outline, I kind of realized, oh, this is taking me a long time. And I'm never really going to get this to the point where my like perfectionist side is really going to want it to be. Mm -hmm. um, so I just kind of need to make that leap of faith and jump and then jump forward. And also I'm not really going to become a better writer if I just don't do it. Yeah. Um, so that, so that was, so that's kind of, I guess, part of the reason that I try to keep things moving pretty quickly. Uh, no, I, I like it. it it's, there's a, a video that I saw on YouTube once that actually depressed the living hell out of me. And, I, and it made me realize it, that like, much like you're saying, it's like, you just got to get it done with. It's this dude who talks about how he spent 13 years working on a graphic novel. And then when he finished it, nothing became of it. And he just realized that he wasted like so many years of his life working yeah. on this thing. And it's all at first I saw that and I'm just like, God, yeah, if you take, if, if you become an absolute perfectionist and do everything yourself, you'll get everything the way you want. But by the time you're done, is it even, first of all, is it, is it even relevant anymore? Is it timeless? And second, like, was it worth it? And, uh, and then I realized like the more I thought about it, like, Oh no, he just, he did everything. He didn't do anything right. And that's what he was trying to say. But what I saw at first was just wasting 13 years of your life. And he's realizing like, it was just being stubborn and going, I need to do everything myself. And like, everything has to be perfect. I don't know. It was, it, it was a right. weird video that made me realize like, Oh, I got to stop dwelling and going, well, I'll get this done. I need to do this first. And it's like, no, finish it and move on to the next thing. <laughs> right. Exactly. And yeah, I completely agree that that, or that sounds like a really interesting um, video to watch. And yeah, I completely agree with that mindset. Yeah. I also really thought that an interesting thing you said there is like, is it really still timely? Yeah. Um, of course you want anything you write to, to some way in some way transcend time, but there are things that can become out of fashion, even if the story itself is still timely or timeless rather. Right. Um, that, that, that maybe it's missed some mark. Um, and I even think rebirth, the gangster, for instance, I started kind of plotting that when we were kind of in the like age of the anti-hero. Right. And now we've kind of moved a little bit away from that. Um, I don't think rebirth, the gangster is completely an anti-hero, but that was kind of at least early on my, a little bit of my impulse in creating it. And I guess that's something just kind of what you just said about the timing kind of just made me think like, Oh, that is interesting. If I'd taken, 10 years to release Rebirth the Gangster, I don't think I would have gotten the traction that I got, for instance, um, to to run a Kickstarter for the second issue and and get it su uh, um, successfully funded and overfunded. And nice. So that's just an interesting point. Yeah. Um, I guess something else that I, I'd like to mention kind of in regard to this is like, we can have that perfectionist tendency. And if you spend 13 years on it and then you put it out in the world, readers might, you might've spent 13 years on something readers are not going to connect to in general. And I think um, that might happen. In, it might happen with some things anyway, but I think it's also part of the reason that I made a conscious effort to really work fast and get things out is that I wanted readers to see what I had to, offer, yeah. to give me feedback and through that become a better creator, a better writer myself. Um, and I think that if you're working for like 13 years on the same project, right. In kind of this vacuum, um, I think that can limit growth of an artist. Um, and I also think it can kind of like make you too closely connected to the work itself so that you lose all sense of perspective. Um, and I've even seen this to myself 
not working on 13 years for something, but right. uh, mapping Mithlin, for instance, I worked for the past couple of years. And there are some times where I'm rereading a chapter and like editing things. And I, I have to ask some people to look at it and give me some feedback because I feel like I've lost perspective. Right. I, either become, I either come off, this is great because I'm seeing all the things that I meant to do and I can like read into that or I go the other side. This is horrible. Um, just because I'm super self-critical of things in the past and yeah. the things I've created. And so I find that like, Getting it out there is a way to continue growing, to get that feedback, to become better and better. And also just at the same time to kind of reduce that fear or that anxiety of, am I creating something that's worthwhile? I, I did say I have kind of these back and forth between it's great and it's, it's not great at all. Oh, of course. But I think that, that I think that they've kind of shifted more towards the middle, the more I've created because I've realized nothing's ever going to be perfect. Not mm-hmm. all, not everybody's going to like what I like, like what I write. It might not be for them. And I just need to let it go. And I think physically letting it go by putting it out in the world, that was like the first step of actually being able to mentally let things go and really just create something the best I can at the moment I have, revise it to the best that I can at the moment I have, but then eventually it needs to go out in the world. And then I'm ready to move on to the next thing to use this past experience to build off and grow and get better. Well, how do you get it out there? Like, where do you promote it? How are you getting the word out about the comic? Because it's one thing also to write it, to write several in your case. Uh, but yeah. then, you know, you, you can put it on a website and it doesn't mean people are going to show up and start reading it. So how are, how are you getting people to read it? Sure. So I think, to be honest, this is probably the thing that I can improve the most out of, I guess, my... Oh, I think everybody can. Like everybody would say career. that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think one thing, when I ran the Kickstarter I had mentioned earlier for Rebirth of the Gangster, that's a really big way to get it out in front of a bunch of people who might not normally find it on Amazon or Comixology, wherever it is, but because there they're some loyal comics fans who and supporters who like just who love supporting comic creators on Kickstarter, it's a way to really kind of expand your audience. Mm-hmm. And so I think that um, even though I haven't really done a Kickstarter since that first one, I do think that was a, like a really big boost and kind of got rebirth the gangster out huh. into some more public awareness than just me dropping it, I guess okay. um, on Amazon and all that stuff. Um, I've also kind of, I have a mailing list and contact list for re- creators or for not, not creators for reviewers, for podcasts, um, people like yourself, I'll add um, you to it. Um, and I just, I kind of keep adding to that and expanding my, my contacts, the more that I've created. So that's, um, another way to do it. Although that kind of runs into the problem of these people probably receive many, many emails about projects. And so it's trying to figure out how to best um, get your email to stand out. And sometimes I've done like the, the, just the like mass BCC email to like all of my reviewers, but I've also um, found that really personalizing and writing individual emails helps out a lot. Um, Yeah. And so I've done stuff like that. I've got on podcasts like yours, but also a few podcasts in the past. Um, I think also something that I'm trying to do a little bit more now is to just expand my con or convention, um, the conventions I go to, like my convention reach. Um, My first couple of years with Rebirth of the Gangster, I stayed right here in Wisconsin. Uh I've since been going to like Iowa, Minnesota, Illinois, and I've kind of now started the Midwest. And then the next step is, of course, expanding outside the Midwest. And is that and exclusive? So that, is that exclusively in the Mighty Con circuit? Nope. Uh, so I have done Mighty Con uh, through or in Wisconsin and Illinois, Illinois. Okay. I've also done the Quad Con in Iowa. And oh, I don't know that actually, one. Yeah, it's a pretty good one. It's also similar to Mighty Con in that it's like a. I, I'm trying to figure out a way to say this without sounding like disparaging or something like that of the big, big cons right. or even, or even like underselling these mighty con and um, the quad cons, but it's a little bit more smaller, a little more intimate. Um, and it's much more focused on like actual comics than if you go to like a big, big con, they're focused on like the stars of shows and all right. this stuff. And that, uh, there's nothing wrong with that either. But I think for me as a creator and to like truly get my my stuff out there more, it, it makes more sense right at this point, at least, to be going to kind of those cons that are a little smaller. And because they're a little smaller, they're more focused on actually like comic stuff. Right. Um, That's and so true. I've, that. yeah. I've also done in Minnesota, I've done a few. Um, so the 
it's the Midwest Comic Book Convention Association, I believe is the name of the group, but they throw like a fall con and a spring con MSP, spring con MSP. Um, they do it on the, the Minnesota State Fairgrounds in Minneapolis. Um, oh. And so I've gotten there a couple of times. I actually went to the fall con maybe a month and a half ago in September. Um, by the way, I'll just... Uh, uh, since we're talking about cons, actually a week from today or a week from yesterday, so Saturday and Sunday, this coming Saturday and Sunday, there's going to be a quad con in Madison at the East Town at, Mall. At East Town, right? At East Town, yeah. I don't quite know specifically where it's, it's at yet. He normally the, the like organizer of quad con sends quad con sends some emails out with a little more. Is it usually there? That just there. seems as as a person who and we were talking before we started here, and you and I are from Madison, and as being an East Sider and someone who worked at East Town Mall growing up. Um, where the hell are they going to have that? <laughs> yeah, I don't There's... know, to be honest. Um, yeah, I have no idea. And so are they like just going to like, like empty out the food court and it's going to be there or what? like, there's nowhere else for it to be, or maybe in the yeah, center, I... but that's not big enough. That, that is, it is something I wonder about, but yeah, since I did well at the Iowa quad con, I figured I'd also throw my hat in the ring for this Madison East town. Good to know though. I, I never heard had, of it. I had your same questions and I've never heard of it before either. No, I actually don't know. I've heard of QuadCon before this, uh-huh. um, but I hadn't heard of it at the East Town Mall. No. So maybe this is the first time, and maybe maybe they'll try it and they'll realize it's not the best location for it, or maybe it'll be like, oh, this is an undiscovered gem. Who knows? Well, the other thing, too, is I know there are a lot of um, businesses are gone there now. There are a lot of empty storefronts, so they may actually have like one of the larger storefronts, like Sears and JCPenney aren't there anymore, so maybe yeah, they're doing it in one of those places. Yeah, they might be doing that. Um, huh. Okay. That would actually whatever, be kind of neat if they whatever, did. What, yeah. Whatever the place is, I know that um, since it's, again, Saturday to Sunday, it is something where we can, like, leave our stuff set up overnight Saturday night. So okay. I don't, I don't it's quite gotta know. It's got to be in one of the stores means, then. But I would think so. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because I know the only store that's – the only large store that I think is still there is, like, Dick's Sporting Goods. That one, yeah. for some reason, re- refuses to die. Um, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, but, I don't know. But I, I mean, yeah, it's been here ever since I moved to Madison okay. 20 years ago. Well, that's kind of cool. So who do you know of that, uh, like, what do you, you don't know what to expect from this thing that you're doing this weekend then? You don't know what it's, what it's going to be like? I don't have any idea the, um, in terms of, again, yeah, like the, the, lo- the location or anything like that. Oh, I just um, mean like the like vendors the, that are going to be there, like, like who's yeah, going to be tabling. Sure. I don't know that I actually haven't looked at a list of the table of vendors or, or, um, or creators, anything like that, but it is something similar to a, the size of mighty con. And I think the makeup of mighty con where you have a pretty good chunk of creators, but then you also of course have some like just vendors who are selling comics and then vendors who are selling toys right. and all sorts of other collectibles. Um, Which, so, uh, sadly, so I'm sorry. I like those too. <laughs> I know that they, yeah. I know it's weird to see them there, but when the first time I went to one, I was like, Oh, you can get toys and comics here too. That's awesome. <laughs> no, I think it's cool too. And I also think they, that those types of, um, those types of sellers bring in a different type of, uh, person to con than somebody who would, if it was just purely comic stuff, right. I, I think there are some people who would, who would not come, but now since there is, there are those collectibles and toys, I think some more people are, are coming or there's at least a, uh, kind of a more variety, a variety of, of people are coming. So yeah. when I, when I was kind of, I guess, I don't mean to disparage any of that, or even when I was, no. I guess, like kind of a little bit, uh, um, throwing some shade maybe on like the big cons of like the actors and stuff like that. I'm not, I don't mean to, to disparage any of that. I do, no. I guess I, I, growing up, I, the cons I went to were all just mainly focused on comics. So that might be a right. little bit of my nostalgia and I guess like old timer syndrome kind of well, acting it, up. But it, I also realize these other things draw more people in. And yeah. that's something that the comic industry desperately needs, of course. So I can't look down on any of that by any means. I just think, um, again, at least in terms of like the, the wizard world, uh, big con type thing where there are a bunch of actors. I know that that's not quite something for me, um, at least as consistently as like a smaller con, just because of, I guess, the type of um, experiences and the t- uh, um, like the, the goals that people have for going to the big cons tends to be a little bit less. I'm going to be supporting a local creator. I'm going to be supporting right. um, this 
so I'm going to be buying a, a bunch of comics and it tends to be more. Yeah. I'll be, I'm coming here to meet a big star and stuff like that. And again, there's nothing wrong with that, but that just from no. my perspective as a creator isn't there's, quite where I need to be right there's now. A, yeah. yeah. There's a balance to it. I mean, there is the fans can be both fans of in, in, in and I'm agreeing with you. It's, it's uh, I think it's good that they're both. And actually it's almost kind of beneficial that they're both because mm-hmm. as a comic fan, you see the Batman movies and you like the, you know, whether you like the Chris Nolan or the Tim Burton version, if both Chris Nolan and Tim Burton were to show up at a comic con, it's a big deal. And you would be like, that's kick ass. You know, I, you can also still read image comics or like vertigo comics and still go see Chris Nolan. And it would be, it's like going to a gallery and seeing a Van Gogh painting, but then you go next door to a small gallery and see some local, you know, it's, it's okay yeah. to be a fan of both. And I understand that both of them exist in the world. And I think both of them are neat. Um, but you know, but also the smaller cons, it's like, you're able to get in there. It's not, if you were to actually be a small creator going to the larger con, first of all, would it be as beneficial to you? And second, like how much would that cost to table it and thing like that? You know, whereas this one you can, it's like what it's for the smallest table. It's like 35 or possibly, I don't remember the going right for it anymore, but it's, it's it's not yeah. it's not outlandish is what I mean. Uh, yeah, I, I know for MightyCon it was like thirty five. The last one that I purchased. Yeah. Um, this this Quad City one that's two days more is more expensive because it's a two day affair. But yeah, that's also you had mentioned the the tabling. Um, yeah. That is that's mainly the reason actually why I don't go to these big cons because right. I need to make a lot more do a lot more business and get a lot more traffic to make that investment worthwhile. And I think again just because of kind of the the nature of the big con. Um, I've, I'm actually, I found that uh, if the con's bigger, I don't do as well because I have just much more competition. Right. Well, and it's a maze. Um, I've gone to one and uh, after leaving going, I didn't know this person was there. I totally missed them. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Know? Yep. Um, and I had mentioned earlier that the MSP Spring Con and Fall Con in Minneapolis, St. Paul, mm-hmm. that is probably the biggest one that I've been to. Um, again, it kind of takes over the whole grandstand for where, for the Minnesota State Fair, which is a huge location. Um, and I, I would say it's like something like 10 times the size of mighty, mighty size of mighty con. And those have been the ones where I've done the, the, I've been the least successful, at least financially in terms of how much I sell there. Uh-huh. Of course I get much more exposure there and people might come to, to Amazon or my store or wherever that, or whatever they want to do. And that, that might help me out long term, but I guess the short term in the, the immediate um, sense of that the day at the con or the two days at the con, I have found that I do much more business in smaller cons. Um, and again, that's just kind of the nature of where I'm at right now. The hope is, of course, to, to one day go t- to be able to be going to a bunch of bigger cons and make it really worth my while eventually. But yeah. I'm kind of building towards that point. And you said before that you have now, I don't know if both or just one of your books is going through a publisher. Yep. So Beowulf is being published by Marcosia. They're a kind of a uh, a smaller publisher in England. And then oh. the gangster is published by my by myself, um, okay. CJSP, CJ Standal Productions. Um, and that was the same thing case um, with the outside the panels book of essays. Um, that's a collection of essays I've written for graphic policy. Mainly I, I added a couple of new things in there too, um, but that's also self-published. Um, so I've kind of got, I've seen both worlds and I, I, I there's definitely pros and cons to each. Um, right. I would think that the, the superhero project I mentioned earlier in the mapping Mythland, um, I think those ones might be also like Beowulf and that they'll be pub- taken up by a publisher that's um, like Marcoja or maybe even a bigger publisher. Um, with mapping Mythland, I'd actually be going for more of a traditional book publisher because that's a traditional book. Um, but I found that, yeah, that's, there are benefits, pros and cons to both. And I started with Rebirth the Gangster self-publishing. And part of the reason I did that is because I didn't have the track record to really entice publishers to to want to work to want to publish my stuff yet yeah and then once i had rebirth the gangster and then started submitting beowulf i got a bunch of different bites uh, much more so than rebirth the gangster so i kind of view it all as kind of you're climbing up that hill and eventually you're i keep going to bigger and bigger and i'm not trying to again disparage self-publishing or marcosia marcosia harry marcos um is the um like the, the owner and publisher of marcosia he's been nothing but super flexible, super right. phenomenal, super supportive. I, I guess I just, I'm the type of person who likes to diversify and I, and also to kind of work my way up. Everybody would, of course would like to be published by some big company too. Um, so I, I, I would like to do that eventually. I have heard from some people though, that they get published by a traditional book publisher and then they still make more money for the self-published books just because of the way royalties work out right. and, and stuff like 
that. So, well, and it's easier so to promote your own stuff. Like when you have that. And also you get the, uh, I mean, I guess I don't know with a publisher, like, do you get author copies? Cause I know with, uh, through Amazon, you can buy author copies. You can buy like a whole bunch of them and you get them at cost and you can have them yeah. and actually take care of it even yourself instead of doing print on the man on demand, which can take a little, a little time, like print on demand. Yeah. When people order it, it's like, well, it's probably going to get to somebody in two weeks. You know, right, and it, and even the last couple months, there's there have been I know um, printer, there have been there have been printer issues and and, uh, and I can't I can't remember off the top of my head what they specifically are, but I do know they've delayed. Yeah, um, even even past that two weeks, it's typically I think that uh, I work with Ingram Spark or Lightning Source is kind of they're different they're different sides of the same company, okay. but I work with them for Rebirth of the Gangster for printing that and for outside the panels. And I do know that they, a couple months ago, had said sent emails about because of these issues and the dis, the supply and mm -hmm. uh, the supply supply chain and other issues involving production and printing um, that they essentially had to double the wait time between when you order something and when you receive it. So, um, so yeah, there are there are they can definitely be a little bit of a, a length. Um, but back to the original question, I know with Marcosia at least I do get author copies okay. at cost. Um, Oh, good. And so that's been working pretty well, and they do turn around pretty quickly. Um, since they are based in England, there's a little bit of a delay in that sense. But right. Yeah. <laughs> um, and well, the what are their what are their distribution channels like? How are I guess I'm curious what a publisher does. I know a lot of people I've talked to have uh, writers, of course, uh, are ones who have said they'd like to get published. And for me, I guess I don't know what the what the what happens when you do get that. Like, what's the bet? I guess I can guess what the benefit is, but I guess I'd like to know what is it? Like, do they take care of a lot of the advertising, a lot of the distribution for you? Do they have outlets that they send it to already? Like what, what is the benefit of it? Sure. So I guess the first benefit is just that there's, even though I think self publishing has like the perception of self publishing has definitely improved a lot over the past decade. Yeah. There still is a little bit more of a stigma to it, or at least people look for that name recognition. So I think that's the, 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 the most obvious benefit of being published by somebody else is that it gains your work a little bit more legitimacy, a little bit more respectability. And that um, I think is of course, I don't know you can't quantify that, but that's definitely a huge benefit. I do know that Beowulf has done a little bit better than rebirth of the gangster lately. And I think that's partly the case for, or partly the reason for that. The other reason might be it's in color and some people are opposed to black and white and just like color comics, but um. <laughs> it's true. There, there is, that's one of those things where it's like, which one do you prefer? And it's, it's a silly thing, but I don't think I ever really pay attention when I read something. I don't go, Oh, this is in black and white. Forget about it. I'm one of those people where yeah. I'm like, I, it could go either way. I don't care. <laughs> yeah. I'm the same way. I do know there are some people that are like, that are like that. And, and to be honest, there are some times where the black and white tells the story better mm -hmm. or at least, can fit the story better or even in the case of like i don't know if you've ever read the bone series back when it was in the original black and white yeah or looked at it since it's been colorized, i think i actually have an issue back here somewhere <laughs> yeah. yes. but um I, I like the skull the classic scholastic color versions are awesome and they really kind of i think sell more like the young to young adults yeah they make it or to, to kids and to like middle grade grade readers and stuff like that i think they look more marketed look they seem like they are a better fit for the market that they are that they've always been marketed towards but i also love the black and white color of the of jeff smith of bone because i think that that kind of sold like some of the darker and like more um thrilling aspects of bone um mm -hmm. and, and made it in my mind i guess something that was more than just for kids not that it really is just for kids even with color but um yeah that's just a kind of long-winded way to say that sometimes there are I do prefer black and white too. Um, maybe that's because that's where originally red bone, but I do think black and white can also help sell certain, uh, certain aspects better. Like I said, like with bone selling the thrill, the thriller, the suspenseful aspects, the like danger of the rat creatures and all these yeah. um, villains, but also I guess to make it, bring it back more to our, my work, um, rebirth of the gangster, I think works better in black and white. Yeah. I think it, it fits the tone better. I think it really kind of, helps you focus more on characterization and the characters and the plot instead of maybe some other secondary aspects of the comic. So I think that there are benefits to both sides. And, and But again, even though that's the way you and I think, that's right. not the way all, all, all creators think. And I think that's something that, even though it's obvious, that's something the more I've created, the more I've had to really think about it. Yeah. yeah the it's way I like to read and consume but that's not the way everybody does. So I need to try to figure out ways to, to be more um, 
marketable to everybody or be, to be to create things that are more um, wide, more open to different types of types of readers, different types of audiences. Right. And, and also, just like you were saying, you're working on one that's going to be for young adults and things you wish you could have read. It's kind of like how um, it, the example I thought of when you were when you were saying the Bone series, um, it's like the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. When that first came out, it was like a gritty, a gritty black and white indie comic. And then all of a sudden it was like, you know, cowabunga dude and, you know, surfer guy this and then got to save April that and all that kind of stuff. You know, it's it changed dramatically, although I still liked both. You know, yeah, it, one too. was more marketable. It's it's one of the, like with the tick. He rewrites the origin story of the tick every like 10 years. Uh, ben, ben Edlund, uh, who made that, you know, the, the, yeah. the, there's always a new tick series in development. Um Anyway, sorry. And I'm, there might be going to be a third tick show in development eventually. Right, exactly. So, to kind of reinforce that point, both those tick shows also had very different styles, even though. Yeah. Like it, it, yeah, part of it's because they were done like 15 years apart, but. Right. Uh, it, you know, it's like I was just I was just getting upset over the uh, Patrick Warburton's going to play the tick. And that's like, no, you can't redo the comic or, or the cartoon series. And then I saw the Patrick Warburton one and I'm like, oh, this ain't that bad. And then they canceled it. And then they had the new one that came out on Amazon. And I'm like, you can't do this. I like the Patrick Warburton one. And then I ended up liking the one they just did. Um, anyway, yeah, I don't know why all of a sudden I'm getting into a critique of the tick here. Um, <laughs> I think I helped walk you down that path, or at least I, just, right. I don't get to talk about the tick much, so I think I was right there for it. Um, but to go, to go back, I think, to your original question, which was, what are the advantages of publishing? Oh, there we go. Um, That's what we were doing. Okay. <laughs> yep. I think I'm, I'm pretty good at getting off on tangents, but I also like to think I'm pretty good at bringing us back. No, And, um, and I'm usually pretty good at that, but I'm also, I'll, I'm always along for the ride when it comes to the tangents. Yeah, I'm, I'm yeah. able to do such a thing. <laughs> Me too. Um, but so, so back to other advantages of the publisher. Um, one thing is that it just always helps have another set of eyes to look at it. I know with Marcosia, like they don't have an, an official editor for my book um, for an editor. I, I have to kind of, hire one myself, okay. but even just Harry Marcos looking over, he's caught a couple of things that my editor missed. And some of them were, some of them were like things maybe the editor shouldn't have missed, but some of them were also things that just, um, for instance, with Beowulf, the first one, the uh, shadow over ends March, that was that 52 page prestige format graphic novel. Um, that kind of just ended really abruptly. Yeah. Um, and he just kind of gave me some quick advice on how to kind of still maintain that ending, but also really preview the next mini series a little bit better. And so that it didn't seem as jarring and as abrupt. So even something as small as that makes a huge difference in the reading experience. And um, again, I had, I've had an editor, but they didn't quite catch it or they weren't looking at it with that um, kind of perspective or lens. And so it always helps to get looking at it. Uh, so that's one advantage. Um, they also have the, have um, better print and production set up than I do. So that's also a benefit that um, they're not just doing like print on demand. Yeah. Uh, they're doing uh, like I am um, not that there's again, anything wrong with print on demand, but no. sometimes it is better to kind of work with a production company that's going to give you a print run and really have maybe a little bit better, better quality control than um, like a, a print on demand, like KDP or something like that. Yeah. Um, and so there are those benefits. They also do have some contacts um, that they, they were able to market uh, Beowulf to um, being a smaller publisher. They didn't have quite as many as I think some other bigger publishers would be. So I think the bigger, uh, the bigger a publisher would be, be for me, they might have more reach in that as in that aspect of um, having contacts of sending it out to reviewers, stuff like that. Um, but then I guess one other thing that uh, to, to kind of one other advantage for publishers is that you also have, have loyal customers of a publisher. The mm -hmm. People who are going to be buying this, for me, well, if people are going to be buying Marcosia stuff day in, day out, or every Wednesday, weekend, week out. Um, and they might not look, give my stuff a second glance until it has that Marcosia um, logo stamped on it. So there is also a little bit of that kind of built in audience too, which is really nice. Um, yeah. I mean, you have, yeah. How many, how many creators, create their independent books. But then once they like sign a contract with Marvel and DC, they actually like create their like imprint under their, under Marvel and DC. And then those tend to do better than maybe they were doing independently. Uh -huh. um, 
at least in terms of the number of set sales. Um, and so I think there is always that benefit of having kind of that a little bit more of a built-in audience. I've always heard that, uh, or at least people have said that they don't want to self-publish because if you do find a publisher, they won't sign you if they find out that you've been self-publishing. And and you're doing both. So, I mean, I, yeah. I always wondered why that was. Uh, I, I think it's weird, but I mean, I guess I get it. And also, is it really true? Like, are, do they care that you're self-publishing another story? I have never heard any or received any communication that they care or that it like has negatively affected their perception of Beowulf for me. At okay. All. Um, I think that I can see maybe like 10 years ago, especially that could be more of an issue. It does seem like an outdated um, construct to me. And I, I don't know where you've heard this from, but I think that this might be a little bit truer in like novels or, or prose text, traditional mm -hmm. publishing, as opposed to comic publishing. Right. Um, I think oh, that there is point. a little bit more of a divide and a sigma between self-publishing and like publishers in okay. traditional book publishing versus comic publishing. And maybe that we can jump back to that T Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, because, but they, well, they, they self-published to yeah. start with, correct? Comics have always been self, like it's been people coming up from self-publishing and getting something. You're right. It Maybe it's just a, maybe they're applying, a, I could see that like being a writer, like if you're just like, oh, and I publish my own stuff and they're like, well, we don't need that, you know? It's, right. Oh, Whereas, know. yeah, you have Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, even back to Bone, that was self-published by Jeff Smith before he got picked up by Scholastic, for instance. Yeah. And I do think there's more of a history of self-publishers rising in the ranks in comics. And so I think there's a little bit less of that divide and less of the stigma because of that. Yeah. So I think there might be a little bit of a difference in, the, in how self-publishing affects you in different mediums. With that being said, though, I still think that even in like a traditional book, or prose medium, traditional books, I do think that gap is, and that gap's lessening and the stigma for self-publishing is lessening. Man, you were a teacher. You looked at both sides of your own argument. I love it. It's, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's, yeah. it's like a, nobody's a winner. You're, you're trying to do that. You can learn a lesson from both sides thing. I like that. <laughs> it's sometimes helpful, although it can definitely make me never like completely commit to one single thing or, or it, can, it can harm in me. Yeah, even like in interviews like this, I can never really be full full force and say like this is the one thing that I'm going to say. Well, nobody should ever do that. True. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, nobody should ever do that. But no, because there's always think... you can always learn something. I even to this day, there's always something you can learn. And and then there are things where it's like I've been doing it this way for something. I wish I could think of an example, but it has happened on the show before where somebody said they did this, and they're like, "Oh, but do you do this after you're done?" And I'm like. No, that didn't even occur to me. I really wish I could think of the example, but it was something so simple. It was just like one little thing where it's like, oh, that opens up a whole new thing. Uh, so yeah, there's always there's always something to learn and, and there's yeah, always a way sense. to look at. I mean, I hate the term outside of the box because it makes no sense to me, but I get what it <laughs> applies to. And there really is a way to go like, you've been doing it this way. And even though it's something unique, there's always another unique way to go about it that will open a door. Um, th that sounds like a slogan. Like all of a sudden I should have had a, just right. the more yeah, that, you know, you thing appear above my head. <laughs> um, but anyway, okay. So you were, you were a school teacher. Actually, I did want to ask about this because the connection of you did the essays and you were teaching. Now, were you teaching writing or artwork or what were you teaching when you were, when you were a teacher in schools? Sure. So I was teaching high school, which the high school I taught was just 10th through 12th grade, just because of they had like an upper middle school that was eighth and ninth, but I taught high school English. And so the class that I probably taught the most was a, just like a 10th grade English class that everybody had to take. But I also taught advanced composition, AP language and composition to oh, okay. writing intensive courses. Yeah. Um, I taught. Um, and then, so those are kind of, I guess, more standard ones, but I also taught two courses that are a little bit more, I guess, special um, in terms of yeah, uh, they're a little more unique. I taught a class called Interdisciplinary Poetics, which is essentially a hip hop 101 class. Oh, um, shout shout out to Eric Piotrowski. He's the teacher who created it, got it like established for like the decade at this high school before I started teaching there. And I took it over from him for a couple of years. Then he kind of took it back over. Okay. Uh, but I also taught this class, the graphic novels literature. Oh, where wow. We read and discuss comics, but also a lot of it focused on creating comics. Um, okay. And so... That was a lot of fun. And again, even shout out again to Eric Piotrowski. He's the one who's been kind of saddled with that class since I ditched him. <laughs> but uh, all of those classes, I think it's just kind of getting that wide range was really a nice way to kind of look at the creative process in different ways. Um, and then also to kind of see different types of reactions to different, to just different types of content. Um, yeah. And then, 
specifically with the graphic novel as literature course, I had been writing Rebirth of the Gangster for like half a year. No, probably a year or so before I actually started teaching the graphic novel as literature. And the more that I taught creating comics, yes, I had a little bit of background and a little bit of knowledge, of course, with Rebirth of the Gangster for that. But the more I taught it, the more I learned from my students and also just learned some oh, yeah. things that, um, that maybe – maybe the students didn't even teach me, but like me trying to figure out like, how am I going to teach this concept and how does a creator do this? And I did a bunch of research on how creators did that. And then I learned more for myself. So I think there was a uh, really, a, especially with creating comics, there was really a big benefit to teaching that class specifically. And that's yeah. actually um, the, the collection of essays that I had mentioned, the essay part, part the essays that focus on teaching are all focused on that class. Um, there are, four or so essays that essentially I wrote at the end of each semester, kind of reflecting on what worked, reflecting on what things I should change, how to get better. Um, and um, yeah, just uh, one of the things that I kind of learned, long story short, even though you should, people should still get the, the essays and uh, buy that book, long story short for those essays, I did learn that the more choice you gave readers, um, the better we like actually started with, um, Fred or with Kafka's Metamorphosis, we'd read like the traditional novella. And then we also read Peter Cooper's okay. graphic novel, which I personally like more than the novella, even though Kafka's cool too, but, um, okay. but we read that and like the purpose was to really kind of crystallize some of those differences in between mediums or media um, between traditional prose and comics prose, but that's a killer way to start a class, yeah. especially with a, to start a semester, especially with, to be honest, a lot of the people who took the graphic novel class were a little, were taking it because they viewed it as the easy English class. Um, and they're, they're definitely reluctant readers. So it was maybe not the best way to start. So we actually started with, um, we started with kind of complete choice text. My last semester switched then to book clubs for like the next unit where they had like a selection of like 10 graphic novels to choose from and they got book clubs there. And then we read um, Mouse, Persepolis and uh, Metamorphosis all as a whole class. And we just looked at some extra that makes sense. like that, the, the yeah. traditional Metamorphosis. So so that's like one example of things I learned, but I guess I also just really learned how to more effectively teach the creative aspect and really just to get p students creating more and more. I used to, um, we had like a Mac lab where we'd have to go to, to use Adobe Illustrator. Um, I was trying to get them familiar more with software that professional use, professionals use oh, yeah. for comic creating um, and we only had licenses on Adobe Illustrator licenses or Adobe Creative of Cloud licenses on those those Mac books in that lab. So we'd have we go there like once a, a week or something like that. And then I just realized, get them creating more and more. Let's do some old school stuff too. We'll still do the new school stuff, but that's an, also just a way to kind of really keep refining those skills and also kind of I guess balance those the, the ways out. Some people really loved the, working with Adobe Illustrator. Some students did not like it, right? And then vice versa. Um, I love so they're they're. I love, I do love though how it started out and you realized like you were like a graphic writing course and everybody's like, cool, graphic writing. And you're like, here, everyone, this is Ulysses and this, you know, <laughs> yeah. read these. They're great. Yeah. And, you know, and all of a sudden it was just like, no, it's just homework. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you adapted to that. And that makes a lot more sense. And I, it, that sucks about the whole licensing thing. I even, so was this even during the time when it was like the cloud version of it or was so, this software versions of it? So this was the software versions of okay. it. Um, the last semester I was there, maybe they had started switching to the cloud, but since it was my last semester there, it wasn't right. something I really was looking to kind of see what to, what we should do with it. Um, but I guess that's to maybe kind of bring it back to something earlier. I think that's just an example of how, unless you do something, you don't learn how to get better. Right. I could have been like designing this classroom in my head for 10 years. And then yeah. I tried, would try to run it with students and it wouldn't work even though I spent 10 years perfecting it. Oh yeah. Um, and what and kids, so you mean just, kids aren't predictable. <laughs> never, never, yeah. um, wow. The reading metamorphosis, both versions, by the way, was actually one of the reasons that this, this graphic novel series or graphic novel course got accepted. We needed to have something like that, that demanded a little more rigor yeah. or in quotes um, that, Selling it as a course was a little bit hard just because it's, of course, something very new and not many high schools do it. So that was part of the reason why I did it. But also to own it myself, I did yeah. think like this is a cool way to show these differences and to really kind of transition away from what they're normally used to, traditional prose, into something they're maybe not as used to. Um, and there was still value in that. That's why we kind of did it more towards the end of the year. We actually had a that unit was just looking at comparing 
graphic novels to, or comics to different media. We did it with the Metamorphosis, but we also read Persepolis and then watched the movie version. Oh, you did? Kind of, okay. A, a so, whereas the first way I designed that, they were actually split up by like a couple of different months. So actually, oh. not only did pushing that stuff to the end work better in terms of like student engagement, it just made more sense mm-hmm. as like a flow of curriculum or as a way to bundle similar things together and have a more like fine focus. Um, and I guess that's, we're kind of getting away from my writing, but I guess that's also something that, again, the more you like, you can throw a bunch of ideas on a piece of paper, but until you actually start writing things and start doing things and start getting a reaction, you don't realize, Oh, maybe this thing that I had planned for like the fifth issue, maybe that makes more sense later on because of the way some readers are reaction, or maybe this is something I wanted to get to eventually but a lot of readers are like, there's like a hole in their understanding or a hole in what they're they're reading and they want this piece of information earlier. So it's something that I can throw in earlier. And again, that's, a, I think, the advantage to kind of doing things and getting it out there and getting feedback instead of just being the perfectionist. Mm-hmm. Um, that being said, there, of course, are things, Mapping Mythland is a good example of how, like, I, I've been writing it more. I wrote it episodically, like I said, as gifts to Carrie, my girlfriend, and then now that I've been going back and I'm revising the whole thing, I start seeing, oh, maybe I can po- start previewing and foreshadowing this thing uh, in this chapter, whereas I didn't get to like this this concept until maybe a quarter of the way into the book. And so there is definitely, of course, advantages to finishing something, taking a break from it. Um, I actually yeah. finished mapping Mythland uh, last year uh, for Christmas, and then I like took like a six-month break from it, didn't look at it, and then came back to it. Um, in this summer and then really started going through and rereading and revising it. And there are definitely things you can notice when you spend a lot more time and you get a break and stuff like that. So there is, there are advantages to both techniques. I think where I was, as I had mentioned, there's like that perfectionist tendency in me. I needed to get things going right away. Yeah. And now that I've noticed with noticed that like there is this other advantage to, to tweaking it a little bit more, spending a little more time on it. I've been doing that a little bit too. Um, with, with mapping Mythland, but even with Rebirth of the Gangster and Beowulf, I've been working ahead more than I have in the past so that if something comes up, I can go back and tweak it. Um, so I used to pretty much write one issue script at a time. And then when I was getting artwork for the next issue, for that issue, I would start writing the script and basically finish the next script by the time that last bit of artwork was, was done. Uh-huh. And um, I've done kind of more like, well, I read a script. I haven't even seen a piece of art from Juan for this script, but I'm really going to start on that next script so that I can kind of stay in that zone and have freedom to be able to, um, for this script, maybe tweak it a little bit more because um, I just have a little more time. So there are, I think there are benefits for a lot of different creative approaches. It just, I think, again, with me personally, I had to go one way and now I'm going a different way just because there are advantages to that. And maybe again, that's just, as I had mentioned earlier, I like to try different things and, uh, I get bored if I do the same thing over and over. And so I think that there was, there's also the advantage. I need to try it this way. And then maybe I'll hopefully kind of do the, a little bit of the, the more in between where I have it a little bit more kind of planned and, and, and um, a little more kind of, I'm like taking my time, but I also kind of will have that space for like these unexpected, like miracles or these unexpected just benefits of, Oh, so I had thought it was going to go this way. Right. Um, but since I'm kind of writing under a deadline, something just the presser of a deadline or something like that made me think of, Oh, I need to do, I should maybe do this instead. Whereas um, if I didn't have that pressure of the deadline, maybe I would kind of s- step away from it for a while and then come back and whatever idea would have been prompted by a deadline won't be prompted anymore. So I think there's a benefit to both kind of styles. Yeah. And again, I think draw, draw from a, not, not that those are the, the only s- types of styles you can use in creating, but I think the more I draw from both of those styles, the better creator I will be. Well, and when would, uh, to to remind people again too, uh, when can they expect the, or when should they keep an eye out for these these different episodes that are coming up? Sure, so, um, so Rebirth of the Gangster, we do have the digital es- issues coming up. Um, issue 22 is actually pretty close to the, I'm just finishing lettering it. So the art's all done. And so that will be coming up in the beginning of December. If you prefer, if you like to get digital issues and if you can't wait for the act, like the trade, but, um, then we have 23 and 24 after that. And those release about every two months. So I would say we're looking at about April for when act for the trade for rebirth of the gangster is going to be coming out. Uh, as for Beowulf, 
um, The Haunting of Chinatown, which again is the second kind of miniseries in the, the Beowulf series. We are about halfway through Act 4, or sorry, Issue 4 of that miniseries. And that once that issue's out, there won't be a huge turnaround time to get um, the, the trade out. I would expect the issue itself will probably also be out sometime more late December. And then I would say Beowulf is kind of like February to March is when we're looking at for the trade uh, of uh, the, the haunting of Chinatown. Okay. And the digital issues are available where? So they're available at Amazon and Comixology. Um, gotcha. So those are where the digital copies are available. Print copies are available pretty much wherever you can order print copies. I saw that. That's impressive. <laughs> yeah. Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Walmart, stuff like that. Um, and so, so yeah, I think print copies, which is typically what people prefer, especially from, from my comics. And I, I'm the same way. I read digital comics on my phone. I have like right. unlimited stuff like that, but for comics that I really want to delve into, I like having that, that physical copy. Um, there's something about the feel of the pages and just the art on like a big level instead of on just the screen. Right. Um, but yeah, so I would, so yeah. Comixology, Amazon are where you can get the digital copies, but most people do tend to get print copies. And I think luckily those are available even more places um, than just those, than Amazon Comixology. Um, I guess the, the, la the last thing I would say is that I do have a website, cjstandleproductions.com and Standles, S-T-A-N-D-A-L. And I have a tab on, one, on, on that website that says kind of places, it has links for where you can go to find, find them. Um, so that's also kind of the one stop shop there. You can also read my blog there. And I also do put up some comics there for free because I'm a writer, but I'm not the best artist, but I do like to, to draw some stuff. So I have, um, like I had a series on the website called Objet de Art, with, um, like Object of Art, basically. And I've done one in that series, which is focused on the standard of Ur. Uh, you are her. so it's like it's the history of this famous historical artifact and it's just like a 12 page comic mm -hmm. uh, i've kind of shifted gears a little bit i'm doing like sketchbook fairy tales and i'm i'm adapting a oh. brothers grimm story the the golden apple because you're not doing enough already <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this enough. man those, those, those <laughs> go a little bit slower partly because they're not my main focus but also right for me to draw takes longer than for me to write <laughs> Even I got though you. Okay. It, might, it might not look that way just because I'm, again, not the best artist. Right. But I do think, um, not to sell myself short, I think that the art works well in like a kind of, if you're if you're a fan of like more independent comics, it still works very well. Um, and I think like the- We like to say raw. Of, <laughs> raw, yeah. And the standard of Ur is like a black and white, really raw. And it kind of almost feels like you're like reading like, um, like a tablet of hieroglyphics or something like that. Right. And I think it works with that subject matter whereas the fetch sketchbook fairy tales looks more like kind of like a kid's book too and so i think it works well with those well i want to thank you so much for being on the show today i'm so glad we got a chance to sit down and talk yeah i really appreciate it